from the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, Outdoor Oklahoma. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. As a result of years of habitat loss, exposure to agricultural practices, and poaching, bald and golden eagles nearly became extinct in this country about 70 years ago. So, in an effort to protect these birds, Congress created the Bald Eagle Protection Act in 1940, and later amended the act in 1962 to include protection of golden eagles. These majestic birds hold great significance to all of us for many different reasons. Not only as a national symbol, as in the case with the bald eagle, but eagles also hold tremendous religious significance to Native Americans. Today we're going to explore in detail this connection between eagles and the Comanche Native American tribe right here in Oklahoma. Our ancestors taught that it's only the eagle that can fly high enough or far enough to commune with the Almighty. So it's a direct link through the energy of the feather and, and thus the energy of the bird to the Almighty. So anytime there's special prayer, special offerings that take place, the eagle has to be present in the form of its feather in order for us to make that connection. For the use of feathers in our lives is not just ornamentation. The use of the feather is essential to our cultural well-being in that we use the feather to connect with the spirit of the bird. In regard to the eagle, our queen nigh, the Comanche word for eagle. It is only right that from a native perspective we're leading the charge as far as ensuring that the use of feathers legally and ethically uh, has a sound foundation in the permits and the laws and regulations that uh, govern anyone's use of feathers and parts of migratory birds. Sia is our Comanche word for feather, but is also our program name for the Comanche Nation Ethno-Ornithological Initiative. That's a long byline, but it describes the fact that we're a program that m represents a marriage of two disciplines. Ethnology, the study of culture, combined with ornithology, the study of birds. So we look at the world of birds, particularly the world of eagles and birds of prey, through the eyes of our culture, and that is what makes us unique. It's the plumage, the feathers of the birds, that represents this situation where Native Americans connect with the spirit of the eagle and the other birds of prey through the feather. The feather is a conduit for this special historic relationship that we enjoy with these incredible birds. So we address the scientific side of the birds, we address the cultural side of the birds in our culture, but it's all done from a Comanche, very unique Comanche perspective. However, that being said, our work does impact the other tribes in that we can produce legal feathers that can be distributed and have been distributed to many different uh, tribes. And we archive cultural um, information, artifacts uh, that speak to other tribal usage in addition to our own. One of the most important jobs of SIA is to address the legality and the ethics pertaining to the use of feathers, the acquisition of feathers, and uh, what activities are legal in this day and time. We've developed what we call an essential species list. The, it involves the species, birds, plant, animal, that are required for keeping our cultural lifeways absolutely intact. When it comes to migratory birds and eagles, too many uh, native people misunderstand what is allowable by law. So in getting the message out, first and foremost, we have to make sure that all of our people, regardless of what tribal perspective, realize 
no commerce. There can be no commerce, real or perceived, with the transfer of feathers. The Bald Eagle Protection Act essentially makes it illegal for anyone to possess or collect eagles or eagle parts. But in recognizing the central role that the eagle plays in Native American religion, Congress created a specific exemption to the rule so that Native Americans could still possess eagles for religious purposes. Members of federally recognized tribes can obtain new and legal feathers through the National Eagle Repository near Denver, Colorado. To request eagle feathers, an individual must submit an application as well as certification of tribal enrollment. But because of the high demand for feathers, it may take more than four years to obtain a particular eagle feather. What has evolved as an alternative way of addressing the need for eagle feathers is the Native American Religious Use Permit. This permit allows the authority to hold live eagles, bald or golden eagles, in a tribally run aviary, whereby feathers molted from these non-releasable eagles, and that's a key as well, the birds have to be non-releasable, birds coming from rehabilitation centers and the like. And the feathers, once molted, can be distributed not only to our own tribe, but to any member of any federally recognized tribe. What we do at SIA is we have spent years researching the best way to authenticate feathers without uh, being invasive to that spiritual aspect of the feather and the feather energy. Consequently, we microchip, we use RFID technology to provide absolute authentication to feathers. And any feathers that leave our hands have been uh, digitally recorded uh, through images that are kept on file, and there's an absolute identity given to the feather and the bird from which the feather originates. So we're really uh, setting the bar even higher than it's ever been, and the most important aspect of this new permit, it's the first ever tribal feather repository of its kind. With our system, what we're doing is if you have a need, it is a particular need. Our native population, we don't just need feathers to sit in a jar on a shelf and uh, you know fill our homes with something nice to look at. There's the spiritual ceremonial component. If you come to us and say, I need X number of feathers for a peyote fan, it's a specific number of tail feathers and a specific number of undertail plumes, upper tail coverts. That is the need that will be addressed and filled, no more, no less, for every set of feathers that are distributed from a repository like ours. I firmly believe the life of at least one bird is saved. Sometimes there are numerous birds required to provide the feathers needed for a particular ceremonial item. So in some cases, an item might represent the demise of many different individuals. So it does have a very sound impact on the conservation and the preservation of our native species. And so it does touch all Americans, uh, regardless if you have any sensitivity to culture or not. Uh, it's uh, respecting and saving the lives of those birds that we all enjoy. You know, it wasn't too long ago when just seeing an eagle in the wild was a rare treat. But with the Eagle Protection Act and organizations such as SIA, populations of eagles have rebounded tremendously across the country. And today, many folks are surprised to learn that Oklahoma ranks in the top 10 of states for its numbers of wintering bald eagles. And to help celebrate this comeback of the eagles, the Wildlife Department helps to coordinate several viewing watches across the state at many reservoirs each winter. With more, here's wildlife diversity biologist, Mark Howry. Well, each year about 16 to 18 locations across the state provide eagle watching opportunities. Uh, they typically run from the early part of December through the early part of March, but the real peak is in about a five or six week window of time from mid-January to mid-February. That also coincides with the peak in, in wintering eagle numbers. Um, most of these locations are at state parks, uh, national wildlife refuges, Corps of Engineers, lakes, or uh, wildlife management areas. Uh, the Wildlife Department, uh, we are a, a, a participant and co-sponsor of four or five eagle watches each year. Uh, and then we help promote all of the others that exist in the state. Uh, and on the uh, Wildlife Department's website, if you go to www.wildlifedepartment.com, then go to the Wildlife Diversity and Private Lands uh, page, 
you'll see an icon for birds and bats. If you click on that, there's a, a schedule there of all of the Eagle Watches each year. It's typically updated in October and November before the Eagle Watches start. Uh, most Eagle Watches are, are free to the public and don't require pre-registration. There are a few that do, so I recommend that people go to the website, look at the Eagle Watches that are available, uh, and, and kind of choose accordingly. Most of the Eagle Watches uh, take place on Saturdays. There's a few on Fridays and a few on Sundays, but most every Saturday in January and early February, there will be anywhere from three to six Eagle Watches uh, available for people to see Eagles. When we come back, we'll get a chance to look around the SEA facility and learn more about the critical work they're doing to preserve their Comanche heritage. But first, this week's Outdoor News Report. Our SEA facility is established very specifically where it is due to our particular band involvement with this part of Comanche territory. What we do here at SEA is fulfilling our station in life and it's the fulfillment of um, a calling and it's truly a lifestyle. Everything that we do, practically every waking moment, is in line with the work. It's living right here with the birds. Well Bill, this is just such a beautiful facility. There's, there's attention to detail everywhere you look and I understand that you've had visitors here uh, from all over the world. Well, because of the global perspective of what we do, we have literally had visitors from all over the world. Um, Maasai warriors have stood here. Uh, really? Our counterparts from Spain and the Spanish Imperial Eagle work. Um, literally people from all over the world. Wow, you think we could take a look at some of these eagles? Absolutely. All right. Well, Bill, I'm no eagle expert, but these look like goldens, is that right? Correct. These are golden eagles, uh, different ages, birds, and different sexes here. These are three golden eagles that uh, are all birds housed under our native religious use permit, mm -hmm. which means that the feathers these birds molt while in our care can be distributed to tribal members almost immediately once they're cataloged. These are all nine-flighted birds that have come in from uh, all across the American West, birds that uh, otherwise would have been euthanized, but under our tribal husbandry, we can keep them as permanent residences here that will benefit our educational program as well as providing feathers for our native people. Well, a new lease on life for these. Basically, <laughs> yes. Now, I'm pretty sure I've never seen one of these in person before. What is this? Well, you wouldn't see it in Oklahoma. This, <laughs> this is a Marshall Eagle, native to the brushland of Africa considered one of Africa's largest eagles. And these are three males. We have females coming in from Tanzania that we're setting up specifically for captive breeding of this species. Well, he's magnificent. Yes, they are. Oh, wow, look at that. That is amazing. Well, it's a unique facility, wow. Todd. You'll, to see birds at close range like this is uh, something most people don't get a chance to do. Now tell me the significance of, of having this many bald eagles in a facility like this. Well, first and foremost, the educational benefit, mm -hmm. allowing our people to reconnect with the living eagle, which is the, um, the thing that's most lacking. Uh, our people can acquire feathers mm -hmm. under a couple of different means, but uh, what they haven't been able to do is to spend time with the living eagle, hence the reason for having a facility where we have it arranged so an elder has a comfortable sitting area. She can just sit mm. and watch eagles for a while if she feels so uh, inclined. Certainly. Well, I think that I would be inclined. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, on the flip side of that is any of the feathers molted by these birds. These are all eagles held under what's called the Native Religious Use Permit. And the primary provision of that permit is to allow the feathers molted by these eagles to be distributed to tribal members, and not just Comanches, but members of any of the federally recognized tribes. Wow, so I guess that's a daily uh, uh, duty, I guess, that, or opportunity or privilege to come in here and get those feathers. Well, multiple times a day, <laughs> actually, during the heavy molt time. Oh, looky right there, real close. What is this? Now? These are Harris hawks, Todd. This uh -huh. is a species of great cultural importance to the Comanche. It uh, is a bird that we connected with at the time we were first being introduced to the uh, Peyote religion. Uh -huh. And these are birds of the 
southwestern part of the United States and particularly arid terrain. Uh -huh. Now those are indigenous to Oklahoma too, right? At one, uh, they they occur and uh, with some rarity, but they do occur mm -hmm. down along the Red River. They, they okay. See. Well, there's something around every corner here. Isn't well, there? there is. There is. <laughs> what do we have in here? Oh, now that looks like These, a red-tailed hawk. Well, what? they are red-tailed hawks, but unusual ones are albinistic red-tailed hawks. Okay. Albinism is something of, of a spiritual interest, too. Well, I'm glad well. you mentioned that because we can study this from the scientific side. Mm -hmm. However, uh, in our hands, these birds are perceived by our people as medicine birds. Mm. Uh, medicine bird is a bird that uh, one like these birds, so different than all the members of its race, that the perception of our ancestors was to be so different meant that these creatures were touched in a special way by the hand of the Almighty. Mm. Well, who do we have here? Uh, this is Shiva, an ornate hawk eagle, uh, in the company of Troy, Troy's co-director of SIA and has been part of this ongoing research for over 30 years. Uh, Shiva is a female ornate hawk eagle. They're native to Latin America and areas of South America, birds of the jungle. Mm -hmm. So we have several pairs of genetically unrelated members of this species uh, set up for breeding to eventually have offspring that can be released in areas of their um, original habitat. Uh, you're having an effect on a worldwide scale here. Well, our work is global. Mm -hmm. Bill, thank you for the tour. What a wonderful facility. Now, who do we have here? This is Thomova. That's our Comanche word for the heavens, which is appropriate. This is the first native eagle ever produced under tribal authority for captive breeding of eagles. The 300-plus wow. eagles Troy and I produced over the years in captivity have all been under permits issued to us as individuals with no recognition of our uh, native background. I fought for many years in this spring. We got through the authorization at a tribal level. So this is truly a Comanche eagle. And oh, as oh. indicated by the uh, stainless steel bandy wears, he's 1001, the <laughs> first ever produced <laughs> under this specific authority. And that's a tremendous milestone of many that you've had. Now, Bill, there's actually attention to detail everywhere you look here, and much of that has some type of cultural significance too, doesn't it? Absolutely. We set out to maintain integrity of design and materials used in executing the design and whenever possible using materials of cultural significance to the Comanche. And much of the exterior material, like the twisted juniper you see behind you, mm -hmm. is of a specific species unique to us culturally. It's uh, Juniperus pinchoi, or the juniper that we use in ceremony, mm -hmm. and it is a red berried, or often called the aromatic juniper of, of the plants. You also have behind us a, a new plant conservatory. Tell me about it. Well, the plant conservatory was put in very deliberately as a means of trying to address our botanical ties with the plants of the Southern Plains. Now you'll see we have many tropical plants. Mm -hmm. The purpose for that is to try to uh, introduce our youth to the wonderful world of plants globally. Then once we're discussing plants of the world, we can then more clearly focus on our plants of a specific Comanche cultural tie-in. It's so unique to be able to come and, and discover a facility like this and the tremendous amount of research and education that's, that's happening here. Uh, and, and you welcome people to come down Absolutely. as well. Unfortunately, it's by appointment only, but if you call ahead, set up a time, we're more than happy to give everyone a grand tour. Our Comanche way is a sharing way, and what we uh, do here is for everyone. Wonderful, and that's uh, an easy website for more information, ComancheEagle.org. Spelled out, ComancheEagle.org. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for the tour and for the insight into your culture and the significance that it, it has for all of us. Well, thank you for being here. Well, thanks for joining us today. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.